This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Recent evidence suggests that real-time ultrasound-guided cannulation of the subclavian vein may be better than the landmark-guided technique when performed electively by an experienced operator. However, the subclavian vein is often considered more challenging to access with ultrasonography than the internal jugular or femoral veins because of the subclavian vein's trajectory under the clavicle. This video demonstrates the equipment and techniques used in the performance of real-time ultrasound-guided cannulation of the subclavian vein. Indications for the use of central venous cannulation include the need to administer intravenous fluids, therapeutic agents, or nutrition, monitor central venous pressure or other hemodynamic indexes, insert a pulmonary artery catheter or cardiac pacing leads, perform hemodialysis, and manage any other situation requiring direct access to the central circulation. There is no consensus regarding the preferred site for central venous cannulation. It is important to consider the risks and benefits of each site before making a selection. Specific indications include infections and pathologic conditions affecting alternative sites, distortion of landmarks of alternative sites. Furthermore, the subclavian site is often preferred for placement of cardiac pacing leads and subcutaneous ports and to maximize patient comfort when an indwelling catheter is needed. Specific contraindications to subclavian vein cannulation include infection of the area overlying the target vein, fracture or suspected fracture of the clavicle or proximal ribs, and thrombosis of the target vein. Coagulopathy is not an absolute contraindication, but it may preclude use of the subclavian vein because of the difficulty in applying direct pressure to the artery and vein as they pass beneath the clavicle. Subclavian vein cannulation should also be avoided in patients with moderate to end-stage chronic kidney disease because the increased risk of subclavian venous stenosis associated with this technique could compromise future venous access for dialysis, and in patients with severe hypoxemia or apical bolus lung disease due to the risk of a pneumothorax that may lead to further respiratory compromise. Required equipment includes a sterile gown and gloves, a surgical cap, a mask, and a face shield. Equipment for the procedure is generally available in commercially prepared kits and should include an antiseptic agent, sterile towels or drapes large enough to cover the entire body, 1 or 2 percent lidocaine, sterile 4x4 gauze pads, non-lower lock or slip tip syringes, which are easy to remove from the needle, scalpel and number 11 blade, and saline flushing solution. You will also need a needle, sutures, and a needle driver. You will need a catheter that is the appropriate length and number of lumens. Those used most frequently in adults are 7 French triple lumen catheters that are 15 or 20 centimeters in length. For resuscitation or dialysis, large bore catheters are preferable since flow is proportional to diameter. For small adults and children, or for those in whom access to the subclavian vein is difficult, 5 French or 4 French catheters can be used. You will also need a compatible skin dilator that is 1 French larger than the catheter, and a guide wire of a compatible size for the catheter. Ultrasound machines with linear array, high-resolution vascular transducers are preferred for cannulation of the subclavian vein. You will also need sterile transduction gel, an acoustically transparent sterile transducer sheath, and sterile rubber bands or clips to secure the sheath around the transducer. Explain the procedure to the patient and obtain written informed consent in accordance with institutional policy. Potential complications, such as infection, bleeding, hemothorax, and pneumothorax, should be discussed. Before starting the procedure, perform an ultrasound survey to evaluate the anatomy of the chest wall and to assess the location and patency of the subclavian vein. In this video, we describe performing ultrasound imaging with an out-of-plane or transverse technique. It is also possible to use an in-plane or longitudinal technique, but the out-of-plane technique is easier to perform and allows for the simultaneous imaging of the subclavian vein and the subclavian artery. When the out-of-plane approach is used, a short axis view is obtained. The target vessels have a circular appearance in the ultrasound image. The subclavian vein lies just beneath the middle third of the clavicle, and the artery runs posterior and superior to the vein. The middle third of the clavicle begins at the point where the clavicle angles posteriorly and is joined by the costoclavicular ligament. Place the probe inferior and perpendicular to the clavicle at a point that correlates with the lateral third of the clavicle. Probes typically have a marker on one side that corresponds with a dot or marker on one side of the ultrasound screen. Align these markers to ensure the image appearing on the ultrasound screen is oriented correctly. The probe marker should be directed cephalad.
Identify the clavicle by moving the probe slightly cephalad so that a portion of the probe overlies the clavicle, which should appear as a bright echogenic line at the left of the screen. A moderate amount of medial and lateral tilt may be helpful to optimize the view of the vascular targets. You should be able to see a short axis image of the subclavian vein and the subclavian artery. The clavicle is typically seen when the footprint of the ultrasound probe, which is the portion that makes skin contact, overlaps it slightly. If the footprint of the probe is fully inferior to the clavicle, you may visualize the subclavian vein, the subclavian artery, and the pleura, but not the clavicle. Typically, the subclavian vein appears toward the right of the screen and at a greater depth than the clavicle. The subclavian artery is typically visualized between the clavicle and the subclavian vein. The subclavian vein is typically larger than the artery, more compressible, and non-pulsating. The pleura appears as a thin, echogenic, linear structure below both the subclavian vein and subclavian artery. Make sure that the subclavian vein is patent by gently compressing the vein with the transducer. Slight pressure should be sufficient to collapse the lumen. Note that the subclavian artery is pulsatile. The use of color flow Doppler imaging can help to identify and confirm the location of the vessel and to determine patency. Continuous electrocardiographic, blood pressure, and pulse oximetry monitoring must be in place. The use of end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring should also be considered. Equipment for providing advanced cardiovascular life support must be readily available. Adjust the patient's bed so that the patient is in a 10 to 15 degree Trendelenburg position to decrease the risk of air embolism and engorge the vein. Consider placing a small roll between the scapulae to help make the clavicles more prominent. Position the ipsilateral arm against the body. Follow standard sterile precautions when placing a central venous catheter. Remove jewelry, wash your hands, and don a sterile gown, gloves, surgical cap, mask, and face shield. Prepare the central venous catheter for insertion by flushing each lumen with saline or heparinized saline. Remove the cap from the port through which the guide wire will be threaded. This is often the longest lumen. Sterilize the skin with an antiseptic agent and cover the area with a sterile fenestrated drape. Be sure to include all landmarks in the sterile field. To prepare the ultrasound probe, have an assistant dispense enough acoustic gel to cover the transducer surface. Then, have the assistant carefully feed the probe into a sterile transducer sheath while extending the sheath away from you, over the length of the probe cable. Eliminate any wrinkles or air bubbles that appear between the transducer and the sheath to ensure optimal acoustic coupling. Secure the sheath around the transducer using sterile rubber bands or plastic clips. Apply a small amount of sterile ultrasound gel to the covered ultrasound probe or to the patient's skin. Because the sterile ultrasound probe is used intermittently throughout the procedure, you should identify a convenient sterile area on which the probe can be placed when it is not in use. The operator should stand at the patient's side, ipsilateral to the target vein. To identify landmarks with ultrasonography, place the probe just proximal to the insertion site. Ensure the image appearing on the ultrasound screen is oriented correctly by aligning the probe marker with the marker on the screen. Place the transducer perpendicular to the clavicle, just inferior to the mid portion of the clavicle, with the orientation marker directed cephalad. A transverse or short axis image of the clavicle, subclavian vein, and subclavian artery should be visualized on the ultrasound screen. The vein and artery can be distinguished either by assessing their compressibility or by using color flow Doppler imaging to reveal pulsatility or non-pulsatility, as discussed previously. The transducer should be slowly moved 1 to 2 centimeters towards the shoulder to obtain the best view of the subclavian vein. It is important to note that the lung lies inferior and posterior to the vessel. The pleura can be recognized as an echogenic linear structure below the subclavian vein. Position the transducer so that the subclavian vein is near the center of the ultrasound image. Gently palpate the skin to confirm that the intended puncture site is aligned with the center of the ultrasound transducer. The approximate depth of the subclavian vein and pleura can be determined by using the depth marker located on the side of the ultrasound screen. Unless the patient is under general anesthesia or deeply sedated, use a 25 gauge needle to infiltrate the skin with a local anesthetic, such as 1 or 2 percent lidocaine. Align the introducer needle with the center of the transducer. Approach the site at a 30 to 45 degree angle with the long axis of the needle directed toward the sternal notch. Puncture the skin with the introducer needle at the center of the transducer, being careful not to damage the sterile sheath. When the needle passes underneath the transducer, the needle tip and the tenting of soft tissue can be viewed on the ultrasound screen. As soon as the tip of the needle appears as a dot on the screen, be sure to keep the needle tip under direct ultrasound visualization. The location of the needle tip may also be visualized by tilting the transducer back and forth or by withdrawing the needle and realigning it. If the needle contacts the clavicle, withdraw the needle and use a slightly deeper trajectory. 
As you advance the needle towards the vein, maintain negative pressure in the syringe until the vein is punctured. To minimize the risk of a pneumothorax, always bear in mind the approximate depth of the subclavian vein and the extent to which the needle has been advanced. Continuously check for the aspiration of blood into the syringe. If blood is not aspirated as the needle is advanced, slowly withdraw the needle while maintaining negative pressure. Venous puncture may become evident as you withdraw the needle. As soon as blood is freely aspirated, set the transducer down, securely stabilize the needle, and disconnect the syringe. Confirm that the blood flow is non-pulsatile. Bright red pulsatile blood suggests arterial puncture. However, dark non-pulsatile blood does not rule out arterial puncture. A commercially available pressure monitoring device or blood gas analysis can also be used to confirm venous rather than arterial puncture. Introduce a flexible guide wire through the needle and into the vein to a depth of 15 to 20 centimeters depending on patient size. While holding the guide wire in place, remove the needle. Now use ultrasonography to visualize the guide wire in the lumen of the vein on the screen in both cross-sectional and longitudinal views. If there is any doubt about the location of the wire, confirm its location by advancing a small gauge catheter over the wire, removing the wire, and connecting the catheter to a manometer or pressure transducer. Once you have ruled out the possibility of arterial cannulation, reinsert the guide wire through the catheter and then remove the catheter while leaving the guide wire in place. Using a scalpel with a number 11 blade, make a small superficial incision at the entry point of the wire to facilitate passage of the dilator through the skin. Pass the dilator over the guide wire, being certain to maintain control of the wire at all times. Hold the dilator close to its tip and insert it under the skin, making sure you do not create a kink in the guide wire. Generally, the dilator only needs to be inserted a few centimeters. Remove the dilator and anticipate increased bleeding at the puncture site. Maintain a grasp on the wire. A 4x4 gauze pad can be applied to the insertion site to minimize blood loss. Once again, only the wire remains in place. Next, feed the catheter over the guide wire, being certain to maintain control of the external end of the wire before advancing the catheter through the skin. You will probably have to pull the wire out of the skin just slightly until the external end of the wire extends beyond the catheter hub and can be grasped. While grasping the external end of the wire, advance the catheter over the wire. If you meet resistance, the tract may not have been adequately dilated. If this issue occurs, remove the catheter and reinsert the dilator. Insert the catheter to a depth that places the tip at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Remove the guide wire and make sure that blood can be aspirated easily from all ports. Flush all ports with sterile saline or heparinized saline solution. Place caps on the hubs and secure the catheter. Apply a sterile dressing before removing the drape or cover the area with a sterile 4x4 gauze pad, remove the drape, and then apply the sterile dressing. Obtain a chest radiograph to assess for proper placement and to ensure that no hemothorax or pneumothorax has occurred. Dispose of all sharps in approved containers. Cannulation of the subclavian vein is an invasive procedure that can result in infection, air embolism, or death. Mechanical complications include placement of the catheter in the wrong position, bleeding, arrhythmia, pneumothorax and hemothorax, an injury to the subclavian artery, thoracic duct, myocardium, aorta, or surrounding nerves. Mechanical irritation of the heart by the guide wire is possible and may cause atrial or ventricular dysrhythmias or even a bundle branch block. If an arrhythmia occurs, withdraw the wire back into the subclavian vein. Arrhythmias are usually transient, but if they are persistent, immediate attention is required. Arterial injury is also a serious potential complication. If pulsatile or bright red blood flows into the syringe, arterial puncture should be suspected. However, in patients with hypotension, hypoxemia, or both, it may be difficult to differentiate arterial from venous puncture. If arterial puncture occurs before dilatation of the vessel, remove the needle or angiocatheter and apply firm, direct pressure to the site for 10 minutes or until there is no further bleeding. If arterial dilation occurs, do not remove the dilator or large bore catheter since this could cause hemorrhagic shock or catastrophic cerebrovascular complication and consult a surgeon immediately. Occasionally, air may be aspirated into the syringe. If this occurs, check the syringe to make sure that the needle or catheter and syringe are firmly attached. If you continue to aspirate air despite firm connections, immediately remove the needle or catheter since the presence of air may indicate that a pneumothorax has occurred. This step is especially important if the patient is having symptoms of increasing respiratory distress. In mechanically ventilated patients, lung injury can rapidly result in tension pneumothorax. Immediately obtain a chest radiograph and insert a chest tube if indicated.
consult a surgeon or another skilled provider to place the chest tube if necessary. Do not attempt to place the catheter at the opposite site since this action would introduce the risk of a contralateral pneumothorax and further respiratory compromise. For persistent bleeding at the catheterization site, apply direct pressure and check the results of coagulation studies. Administer blood products as needed. If bleeding continues, there may be an arterial venous tear that requires surgical exploration. Again, in any of these circumstances, do not attempt to place the catheter at the opposite site. The dressing should be changed whenever blood or liquid accumulates or if the dressing loses its seal. To minimize the potential for infection, minimize the number of times the catheter is accessed and do so only under clean conditions after the site has been prepared with an alcohol-based solution. Assess the patient daily to determine whether the central venous catheter is still needed. It should be removed as soon as possible. Central venous catheters are placed for a variety of reasons. The provider should be aware of potential complications and consider alternatives to central venous catheterization whenever possible. Although definitive data are lacking, specific advantages to the subclavian site, as compared with other sites, may include reduced risks of infection and thrombosis. As compared with the landmark guided technique, the use of ultrasound guidance for cannulation of the subclavian vein may reduce the rate of mechanical complications, decrease insertion time, and improve the overall success rate of the procedure.